notwithstanding the many, part, many praiseworthy achievements, I earnestly hope that the hours ahead will also see the announcement of uh, new ambitious initiatives and partnerships across sectors, communities, and regions. Accelerated action to reduce deforestation and degradation and to restore forests is needed now more than ever. Mahatma Gandhi once memorably wrote, what we are doing to the forests of the world is but a mirror reflection of what we are doing to ourselves and to one another. How right he was, and how pertinent this remark continues to be in 2015. For despite all our efforts, we continue to deplete the forests of the world with profoundly negative consequences for our well-being and for the planet at large, including, most importantly, on the occasion of COP21, its climate. Well, yesterday I was heartened to see, as I'm sure many of you were, the statement by political leaders on the importance of forests and their announcement of ongoing domestic action and international support for forest conservation efforts around the world. That forests should be featuring so prominently at the outset of the COP is, I hope, an encouragement for all of the governments, organizations, and communities present today. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I very much uh, doubt that in a room entirely filled with so many uh, international forest experts and policy makers and, and a few others, uh, that you need me to set out the importance of forests on so many fronts, whether climatic, cultural, intrinsic or biological. Suffice it to say that scientific advances are continuing to increase our understanding of the critical contribution forests make to all our lives, as well as, of course, adding to a sense of the deep peril we will encounter should their destruction continue. And perversely, we persist in going on literally testing the world to destruction. And so I, I thought that instead that I would focus my remarks at the outset of your session on three, I hope, practical ways in which uh, I believe we can make a positive difference to the fate of the world's forests and climate in the years ahead. The first is on the issue of forest peoples and indigenous peoples. And I'm so glad that forest communities are represented here today. I believe first and foremost that we must do all we can to support the communities that live within forests or alongside them to continue to protect and cherish those forests over time. For indigenous peoples, this is a question of the proper safeguarding of their reserves, their traditions and cultures. For forest peoples, more generally, a question of good governance, institutions, land tenure reform, adequate support, and extension services. All our efforts should, in the first instance, be guided by the people whose lives uh, are so much more intimately intertwined with the forest than our own and that the approaches we take should both recognize and protect their rights and draw on their wisdom, their perspectives, and of course their hopes for the future. I think um, we should all acknowledge and salute the work in this direction over several decades of many present uh, today, including community leaders who have done so much to ensure that the voices of the indigenous and forest peoples have not been silenced and lost. My second reflection concerns the transformation of global commodity supply chains. Encouraging though the progress made to date has been, 
it remains the case that many of the world's largest companies and their financial backers pay scant, by which I really mean no, attention <coughs> to the deforestation footprint of their supply chains. Unsurprisingly, perhaps, this is especially true in markets where there is limited consumer pressure to do the right thing. It seems that um, the vital role forests play in generating and regulating the rainfall upon which agriculture and food security depends is of itself insufficient incentive to act responsibly. So I would therefore encourage you all to redouble your efforts emboldened by the early successes achieved by some of the pioneer companies in this area to enable this shift in global markets to happen. Stopping deforestation has to become the goal to which all commodity companies are committed with zero net deforestation becoming the norm rather than the exception. And in this respect, I would very much like to thank Paul Polman, the CEO of Unilever, who has done so much to galvanize his peers and colleagues in, in this sector. And thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, I, I hope we might all act further in the years ahead to bring about at a large scale the kinds of sensitively conducted and ecologically resilient forest landscape restoration that the world so urgently needs to see. Given that uh, we have managed to reduce the world's tropical forests so significantly over recent decades, with over 500 million hectares lost since 1950, the restoration of forests and forest landscapes should not be an afterthought, but instead surely an equal priority to halting deforestation and degradation. As all the um, horrors of even a two degree warmer world bite, and bite they will, we are going to need a lot more forest, not a slight reduction in the existing rate of attrition. Now all of this, of course, is brought sharply into focus by the recent science which tells us that as much as a third of climate change mitigation can come from forest and the land use sector more broadly. And in light of this, the uh, increased attention given to forest protection and restoration over the last few years is, of course, to be hugely welcome. But in recognizing that the true value of this critical Paris conference is what happens afterwards. There is perhaps an argument that international processes could in coming years give even greater consideration to the role of the of forests and land use in both climate change mitigation and adaptation. For each of these pillars of work and all the others to be discussed today, such as the, the vital issue of protected areas, another cause close to my heart, there will need to be political will and leadership at the highest level, as Isabella Teixeira, the Brazilian Minister of Environment, communicated so forcefully and articulately at a meeting on forests I hosted in London uh, at the end of October. And incidentally, uh, I'm so glad to hear that this meeting contributed to the momentum uh, of today's discussion. So, with political will and leadership, spurred on in turn by further leadership from the private sector and from civil society, everything becomes possible as Brazil and others are beginning to show. In fact, as you all know, it is only with bold commitments, leadership, cooperation, and tenacity that it will be possible to safeguard the world's forests. Without which, ladies and gentlemen, we have no future, or certainly not one, that we would wish to inhabit. This, therefore, 
really is a critical session. And on such a vital subject, there can be no room for failure. It is very simple. We must save our forests. For there is no plan B to tackle climate change or many of the other critical challenges that face humanity without them. And uh, you, ladies and gentlemen, are the people who can lead the world in this vital endeavor. And I can only hope and pray for your every, every possible success today and, and in the years ahead. Thank you, Mr. President.